Hi, my name is Krishna Sadasavam, and I'm the creator of PC Weenies, and I'm also an illustrator, and you can see my work at krishnadraws.com, and you're listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. This is a rare occurrence for me. I am, I'm happy, I'm excited to have this guest on the show. I've not had him on the show since maybe 2013, 14, but face to face, I've not talked to him since Kids Read Comics 2012. I'm, I'm almost thinking maybe a couple of years earlier than that, but we're joined today by the ever talented creator, Krishna Sadasavan, of course, from, you know him from PC Wings, but he's also a very talented illustrator and artist. How are you doing today, Krishna? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show, Kurt. You know, after 10 years, I, I'm finally glad I keep getting your name right this time instead of messing up. <laughs> You've got it down, man. I mean, I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, sometimes I have trouble saying my own name, so I think that, you know, you're, you're doing a fantastic job. Well, we have a lot to catch up on. Um, I am, I'm so excited to have you on because truly it has been um, a pleasure seeing you uh, grow in your career. It's been amazing to see what you've done from an illustrator standpoint, from what you've done in your life as well, too. But for those that don't know how you got started, tell us the be very beginnings of, of Krishna. Oh my gosh. Well, first I came back home from the hospital. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember much of that, but uh, professionally I've been, uh, you know, uh, working uh, for the last 20 years or so as an illustrator, comics artist, etc. And um, I got started in the wide world of web comics back in 1998. I think that I might be the very first Indian American making web comics. I, I don't know if someone can fact check me here, but that was brought up to me, uh, you know, over the course of uh, another interview years ago that I had with another uh, uh, newspaper or a magazine. So that's pretty a cool distinction, but I was making web comics for about 20 years. Uh, PC Winnie's was a tech focused comic and uh, I updated it three times a week. It started out as a single panel strip. And then in 2008, I took it to a multi-panel strip. The strip was put on ice in 2018 and uh, you know, it's sporadically popped up. The website is pcweenies.com, like Beanie Weenies with the two E's. And uh, so, you know, I haven't fully, you know, let that go, but life has become very interesting and it's become very busy. So the comic had to take a back seat so that I could explore other avenues. And these days, in addition to teaching, so I teach at the Art Institute of Tampa. I also have taught at the University of South Florida and I've also taught at St. Pete College. Uh, when I'm not teaching full time, I am working on freelance work and um, I've got a few projects in the pipeline, some of which I can share and some of which I can't, but um, it's, a, it's been pretty exciting. I've had some really good opportunities over the years and it's just fun seeing, um, you know, the path my career has taken. It's just kind of moved in a very unconventional way. Um, a lot of folks may not know that I was actually an electrical engineer. Uh, studied engineering and, um, you know, actually worked for four years as a chip designer hmm. before deciding to go back and get my MFA at SCAD. So uh, I've, my life has been fairly unconventional and, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, I think. No, no, you, you've had a, a very career and that's the spice of life. I mean, I'm sure it's definitely helped you in your, in your artistic endeavors uh, in illustration as well, too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, from, from your experience, especially teaching the younger generation, you know, what is one thing that you've seen in, in your decades of teaching that always is consistent no matter what class you teach? Well, that's a great question. There's always those that um, are very hungry and interested in learning new things and they're open-minded and they're willing to take direction. And there's uh, folks that just want a pat on the back and that hasn't really changed. It's like when you're going into an, any kind of a commercial art endeavor, it's really important to, to be open-minded and resilient. And I'm very pleased to say that I've had students that have gone on to massive successes, you know, working at various companies like Nickelodeon and um, ArenaNet and uh, let's see, what's the company? Uh, Sledgehammer Games, Microsoft. 
uh, to name a few. Uh, and um, all those students have something in common. They have been incredibly hardworking, very open to taking direction and not afraid to put the time in to honing their craft. And, you know, it's a very competitive industry and not everybody gets to, to quote unquote, live the dream, but, you know, it's really, you, you get what you put into it. And I've always been there to help my students out. Um, you know, when, you know, whenever they need my advice or they need some feedback, I, I've always had an open door policy with my students. Yeah, the, the illustration industry, it kind of gets misconstrued or mis, what am I looking for? Misunderstood is the word I'm looking mm -hmm. for, especially because a lot of people think illustration as comics rather than graphic design or anything along that line. Um, mm -hmm. How have you been able to differentiate in your own career the difference between your, your comic style to what you may see on, say, a poster or an advertisement? Well, I, you know, I, I try to be adaptable. Of course, my first love is comics. I, you know, how I got into this whole thing was comics and animation. Um, and, uh, you know, but you have to weigh the needs of what your client wants. I've been very fortunate in that uh, people have discovered my work through my website and have reached out to me for the specific thing that I do. Um, and that's been very, very helpful because they know what they're going to get. But there have been those clients where I'm asked to, you know, go ahead and do something out of my wheelhouse. And, you know, I just have to uh, challenge myself. I mean, one of the things that I'm really pushing myself on right now, because I've been heavily into Photoshop and Clip Studio Paint and, you know, really have immersed myself in a very raster based, you know, way of working. But my goals for this year is to, you know, to really level up my uh, knowledge of Adobe Illustrator. I've used Illustrator a handful of times. I mean, I'll be the first to say that I'm not super great at Illustrator, but it has been more and more tantalizing for me. And, um, you know, I, I'm learning, you know, everything, you know, from the ground up basically and, and uh, finding resources and, and just trying to make my way through that program and get better. And I've, I've really enjoyed it. I'm taking it as a spirit of, um, you know, just having some fun with it. I think that when I'm learning something, it's more amenable if I can actually use the thing that I'm learning in some projects. So I'm, uh, you know, trying to find new ways of using Illustrator for uh, different projects, just kind of like forcing myself to not rely on my usual crutches, which is, you know, just jumping into Photoshop. <laughs> Do you go back to the traditional method or analog method of, of drawing every so often just to kind of keep your skills fresh? I do, especially during meetings. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, in, in all seriousness, I love drawing analog. Uh, you know, the, the problem that I had for a number of years is that I had just no space. And, um, you know, finally, you know, it came to a point where I had too many sketchbooks and I, I literally had to unfortunately throw away several of them because I just, I did not have the room. And I don't look at that as uh, you know, in some ways I was a little bit sad at, at that process of doing that. But in the end, the sketchbook is like a dojo where you learn and hopefully you've absorbed certain things from that sketchbook. And I've kept a few, I haven't thrown away all of them, but you know, I had to cull the herd. <laughs> Um, but, um, I still like to dabble, uh, with traditional means and, um, you know, I used to have a light box where I would go back and I would, uh, ink something that I would draw digitally. So I would do the sketch dig uh, digitally and then I would print it out and ink on top of that. But it just became a space issue for me, but I do have my traditional inking tools on campus. And, you know, when we had classes on grounds before COVID, um, we would have a project where the students would have to use traditional inking tools. Mm -hmm to go ahead and create small five inch by five inch um, uh, postcards and we'd hang them up and we'd have a, a topic and uh, we would just put them up on the wall. So, uh, you know, I think it's important for my students to also appreciate the fact that there is no undo when you're drawing traditionally. But um, I would like to get back into more traditional work, but you know, when I'm doing any kind of client work now, it just seems like, you know, everything has been digital. It's like, um, it, it's just easy, it's low maintenance and the file can be doctored or manipulated, you know, after the fact. And I guess I've just got, gotten accustomed to it, but I, I'm not averse to going back to, to, uh, to traditional tools. I dabbled with art back in high, back in university, I should say, when I had to go back for my double major in visual arts and film. Mm -hmm. And when you're forced as a logically minded person, as, as you are, you're both logical and creative. So you're, you're left and right brain together, which is, is awesome. For me, it was 
drawing perspective or drawing proper heights of people. I was never accurate in that whatsoever. What's your kryptonite as an artist? I've got too many. Uh, <laughs> I think my kryptonite is that I, you know, if I'm being totally candid, I, I tend to fall into the same subject matter uh, when I work. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's like Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator, and, and just get going with a more vectorized, simplified, you know, almost like icon based design. And, you know, that's always been something that's been interesting to me because I also like to dabble with retro computing mm -hmm. stuff. So lately I've been getting into my old Macs and nice. uh, rehabilitating them. And, you know, there's just an aesthetic that I, I really find uh, to be very interesting. And it's just so simple. And it's just, you know, there's not as many, it's not photorealistic, it's all pixel based. Mm -hmm. So my kryptonite would probably be, you know, I just need to go ahead and branch out more uh, with not only some of the tools that I'm using, but also um, just, you know, exploring beyond different subject matter. And, you know, when you're working uh, full time and then you come back and then you're, you know, working on client work, sometimes it just becomes difficult to say, okay, well, what am I going to draw for myself? And you might be able to squirrel like an hour or two where you just have a little bit of time before you have to go to bed. And I go to bed late. I go to bed like around 11, 30, 12, just because I want to have some time for myself where I could do my own thing. But I'm usually giving myself, uh, <laughs> that's usually when I'm on my last ember. So sometimes I just end up drawing the thing that I want to draw. And so I don't know if that's my kryptonite, but I just definitely can see that about me. Um, where I, I would like to kind of push myself even more. And with things like perspective, uh, you know, I don't have a problem with that. And, you know, I, I've had to kind of learn and I found some digital workflows. And, you know, I know that later on we're gonna talk about my YouTube channel, but I'm trying to go ahead and basically disseminate all the tips and tricks that I've gathered over the years and share them with not only my students who happen to watch the videos, but also for anyone who's interested and um, it's just an effort to go ahead and give back to everyone who has been so helpful in, in helping me out to get to where I am. Obviously your, your illustration, you're drawing from uh, references, real life, et cetera. I mean, that, that's a given and being an artist as it is though. Were there any other past illustrators that you looked at, um, even from your engineering days that you thought, you know, this is the type of person I want to emulate? I think it goes back for me to the time I was maybe three or four years old. Chuck Jones and the old Warner Brothers cartoons were my absolute first love. And uh, I'm not going to lie, like for the first maybe since I could hold a pencil up until I was maybe 12 or 13, I literally only drew the Roadrunner and Coyote. I was just obsessed with that cartoon. Um, and then from that point on, I just, you know, discovered, you know, G.I. Joe and Transformers and then eventually you know, found my way in the Marvel universe. And, uh, you know, so as my tastes have kind of grown and evolved, so has my art. And I'm still drawn to that period of time from like the mid eighties to the early nineties, where that's just kind of like the zeitgeist of where everything kind of came in and um, where, where a lot of my interest and passion falls in. Um, you know, and then going on to comic books, it's like John Byrne, you know, uh, you know, he was one of the first artists when I was reading comic books that I started really recognizing his style and, and, and his draftsmanship and his ability to convey action and just an amazing storyteller. So he was the first artist that I really kind of picked up on. And then, you know, in terms of contemporary artists that I'm really blown away by, uh, you know, Chris Samney, who's, you know, work on Firepower and Daredevil he's got this really beautiful silver age quality, which I like. I mean, I'm drawn to artists of all walks, but I particularly like those that kind of follow this Alex Toth style, this like very minimalistic, but everything just makes sense. And it's deceptively, it looks easy, but I can tell you it's not easy just to figure out what lines not to include. That for me is super impressive. Now, there are artists that do a really great job of adding all this detail and rendering and my hat's off to them because I just don't have the patience. I know for my own self, I don't have the patience to overly work a drawing like that, but I really have a strong affinity for folks that can say more with less. And, uh, you know, I have to say Chris Samney is probably my favorite artist, uh, you know, that I just follow his work no matter what he does. And also, um, 
let's see, there's a guy named, uh, uh, gosh, it's like uh, Daniel Warren Johnson, who did Murder Falcon, who's also working on Beta Ray Bill. He's a, he started out as an independent cartoonist and he's now working for Marvel. And I've loved his stuff because it kind of combines like this really frenetic energy of manga with, you know, Western uh, sensibility. So you can see that there's an influence between East and West in his work, which I really dig. Looking at everything else that you've done, you, you talked about your YouTube channel. Now's a good time to, to bring it up though. Um, you started this obviously before the pandemic. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's, that's a good thing. Uh, at least you're, you're being creative. What exactly do you offer on your YouTube channel? So, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things that I researched before even deciding to throw my hat into YouTube, because it just seems like everybody's already talked about everything, <laughs> honestly. So that was kind of intimidating to me. Um, I did have a student of mine who was already building his YouTube channel when he was in my class and his name is Steve Camargo and I'll go ahead and, uh, he, his YouTube channel is kicks art and he specializes in drawing sneakers and he's like really into sneakers and shows people how to draw sneakers and how to color them. And I've watched him go from like a hundred subscribers to now 28 or 29,000 subscribers. So we would have these conversations and he would always be encouraging me to, uh, hey, he would say, why don't you make a YouTube channel? And I, I really, I didn't feel you know, like I had really anything much to give. But then the more I started looking at it, Kurt, I started seeing that there are a lot of YouTube videos that are geared towards the rank beginner, someone who's brand new that's just getting into it. And then there's more videos for like f folks that are fairly advanced that are looking to really level up. And what I saw was an opening for this idea of intermediate digital artists. Like, okay, so you have some experience with digital tools but you just want to get better. And, and that's where my niche is. So, um, you know, I started the channel in 2019. It just kind of lapsed for a little bit because I was also working on another project called Kill Art Block. Uh, and there's a website, killartblocknow.com, which was my initial thrust, which is like, you know, blogging and interviewing cartoonists and illustrators mm -hmm. to find out how they overcome art block. And um, so I, you know, that's still kind of an ongoing concern, but I just have to keep making content. It's a solo uh, gig. I'm the only one who's managing that site. So it's like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to manage, uh, you know, that. And, um, and then the YouTube thing came about because last year we started to teach virtually mm -hmm. and I felt like, okay, there were, I, I had to make a ton of videos for my students. And those are all like videos that are on YouTube, but they're unlisted. Mm. But I wanted to create some supplemental videos that I could share between all of my classes and make those publicly accessible as well. And that's really the impetus behind my YouTube channel. I wanted to be able to point my students to the fact that, okay, we didn't talk about this in class, but I did make a video on it. So please go check that out. And if anyone else can benefit, I don't know what the whole demographics are for my YouTube channel yet because I, I, I'm still very new at this. I think I, as of this uh, taping, I've got about 220 subscribers, which is great. That's I mean, awesome. honestly, it was like about a hundred, just like about a month ago. So it's growing, but I don't know like what, what portion are folks that have me as an instructor in their course or folks that are just like finding it through like a recommended video or a Google search. So that'd be kind of interesting to know, but you know, I want to share information. Um, I've always been that way. There's no secrets. If people look at my work and they want to ask something about how did I do something, I'm always willing to share. And, um, you know, sadly I've run into other folks, you know, not to name any names, but there are some people that are very guarded about like what they do. And I've always prided myself on, cause I've asked these folks like, Hey, how do you do that? It's like, well, I can't really tell you how I did that, but I will figure it out because I'm tenacious like that. And then I will share that with everybody else because you know, if you have to rely on, if you have a special trick and you can't share that, that means that you're really beholden to that trick. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you, you have to, you have to be confident enough to where you can, um, you know, share what you know and still feel like, you know, you're your own individual. Like I'm not trying to create Krishna clones <laughs> where people draw exactly like me. So I always couch it with the idea, like, this is the way I do it guys. Uh, this is not, I'm not saying you have to do it this way, but this is just what I do. And I think that going in with that spirit and that attitude, I think has been um, something that hopefully people pick up on when they're watching the videos. 
Well, it, it reminds me back in my IT days because I always used to say there's like four ways to do this exact same process. It doesn't matter how you get to this end result. You're going to get to it with one of these four ways type deal. Sure. So, so yeah, the, the, the ability to be flexible in, in not only your art style and, and what your end result is going to end up like, whether mm -hmm. it's similar to what you've done on your YouTube channel or maybe they find their own twist at the end, who knows? You bring up the whole guarded aspect of, of guarding the secrets of, mm -hmm. of, of art and it's like, well, you're not the only one that said that. That's the funny thing. Like a couple of interviews ago, I mm -hmm. someone said the exact same thing. Like, really? why, why are you, you know, he talked about toxic positivity, you know, why, why are you guarding a secret when you should be sharing your knowledge? Why are mm -hmm. you so beholden to that technique or the, or that, you know, that gateway that you've just crawled into? Mm -hmm. uh, why aren't you sharing your wealth of, of your experiences with the masses and and that's why a channel like yours especially is, is wonderful to see because you know you're imparting knowledge you're being an, an educator and you know you're also mm -hmm. creating great content as well too to to um, expand the masses and, and their, their knowledge base so it's great to see yeah i mean you know i i come from an era where you know when i would go to the library which would be my only source for getting any kind of art book the number of resources you could count them on one hand there weren't very many art books there certainly were no graphic novels or comic books back then uh so i would always go to the art section and check out whatever how to draw books existed and they were very few and far between and so now we're in the opposite end of the spectrum where there's just so many great resources that are available i mean even if youtube is not your cup of tea there are like you know lynda.com there's like you know a skillshare there's there's a host of books, there's a host of tutorials. You know, it almost seems like the floodgates have totally opened up to where, you know, people can really, uh, you know, if they want to learn something, it's out there. So in, in that specific sense, uh, you know, the other thing is like, how do you kind of like rein in the fire hose and figure out what you want to do? So, you know, I'm not putting out a new video every day because I have to give it a lot of thought. Like sometimes my videos will be very short and sweet. And sometimes it'll be like, okay, watch me as I work and let me explain my thought process. The video that I just posted yesterday was exactly that. It was just a video where I'm drawing a beach environment and, you know, I, I drew it without recording my voice. And I went back and I added a voiceover just to go ahead and explain the process because it's one thing to see somebody work but then to understand why they made certain decisions the way they did and also to see them make mistakes because um, you know sometimes you'll watch a video or a tutorial where it's like man it's just flawless and my hats off to those folks that can just you know create something without even making a single mistake i mean you know you're a better artist than i but you know i think it's important for folks to also see that hey you know you know sometimes you're kind of like on the tightrope and you are going to make a mistake you are going to fall down but What's important is you get back up and you continue on. What lessons have you learned from creating your YouTube channel that you can share with the masses? Uh, just to be authentic. Uh, you know, I, I also, I'm very uh, averse to saying, please like and subscribe. <laughs> I, I, you know, and especially like, I watch a lot of YouTube videos uh, and I never thought I'd be that person that would be just like, I, I subscribe to a bunch of channels, but I do. And I find them a lot, to, you know, uh, because of my different interests. I like cars, I like retro computers, I like comics. I have several subscriptions that I follow, but the ones that I think I gravitate to the most are the ones where the content is so good and useful that I will subscribe, I will like it. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, I, I just want to feel like, okay, if you're coming here to see me work, then you either like what you see or you don't like what you see. And if you, you know, everyone's telling you to like or subscribe. So you already have that kind of process ingrained. So I don't need to go ahead and do that, especially before I even begin my video, because I have no idea if the person watching the video will be watching, you know, maybe video number 45, and that might be their gateway into all my videos. I'm not going to be able, I'm not going to feel good about just asking them to like and subscribe before I've even shared any iota of knowledge. So, you know, 
you know, I think the, the, the most that I keep it to is like, after I finish my video, I'm like, Hey, if you found this video to be useful, you know, please share it with a friend and that's it. You know, I mean, if you want to do that, you want to do that. If you don't want to do that, that's fine too. Um, the other thing too is, you know, having a microphone and having some good screen recording software. So uh, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the tools that I use. I'm on a Mac and I use this program called CleanShot, which is way better than Apple's own uh, screen sharing tool. It's about, I think, 30 bucks or something like that, but it offers way more customizability. For one thing, it also captures uh, your keyboard shortcuts and I use a lot of keyboard shortcuts. So it does display them on the screen as I work, which is super handy. And then I also use Final Cut to go ahead and record my voiceover. I don't do a lot of editing. I might just use like a, you know, a few filters like the dissolve or whatever, or the wipe, sorry, but um, I don't go crazy with it. I'm not a Final Cut expert by any means, but I know how to edit. So um, I just let it run through. I try to do it within one take and, you know, um, and put it together. So uh, don't worry about making a perfect video. Um, there's no such thing. It's just like with web comics. And Kurt, you've, I know you've read PC Weenies for a number of years, but when I started PC Weenies, I didn't know a single thing about Photoshop and the art was pretty terrible. And I was just kind of walking around in the dark. And I remember reading a review about my comics. I think this is when I was still doing single panel and it was a pretty brutal review. It was just like, I can't remember the name of the person that wrote the review, but it was just kind of like one of those things where you, you read the review and you just feel like, man, he's just shooting me right in the face. <laughs> and I, I felt, you know, I felt hurt, but it's like, I also took that feedback and, and kind of said, okay, well, this is what this person's telling me. And, you know, I don't know this person from Adam, but maybe there's some truth to that. And, you know, I, I started to try to get better at it. And I'm, I'm not saying that I've, I've gotten, you know, to the point where I, I feel like I'm a master at this, but, you know, I did feel like I've improved because of that feedback. So just put something out there, uh, try to be somewhat consistent, but you don't have to put out a video every day. Like some of these professional YouTubers I see, they'll have a video out every single day and that's their job. And, you know, they've probably got a, uh, recording team that helps them edit and, you know, uh, do all the behind the scenes stuff. But, and I see that with a lot of tech YouTubers because they have to be able to, uh, you know, crank out new videos based upon what's coming out in the, uh, consumer space. But. I just can't do that. And, you know, I also have to have some semblance of a, a, a life. So I'll make a video when I feel like I have something to share and I'm trying to at least do it once every week mm -hmm. and uh, just get started and share what you're doing. You know, I mean, you know, spread the love. And if you, if you want me to, to look at your YouTube channel and, and take a look at it, if you're doing something related to art, just please share it with me. I'm on Twitter. So you can always, you know, don't spam me, but just send me something that might be interesting. And I'll, you know, I, I love to learn. Yeah. I think that's the one thing it's like, what inspired me the most about YouTube is the fact that people are so free to share what they truly love. You can find their, you know, you hear their passion when they're talking about an old Mac or they're talking about a car that they're restoring. It's like, there's just something authentic that just pulls me in and makes me want to uh, I, I connect immediately with the person, you know, if they're giving of themselves like that. So I hope that I can try to do the same thing. Knock on wood, safe to say that I finally have a, a buffer, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is why I've been pushing so hard on social media to get interviews like this. So I can focus on, you know, the things that are lacking, like, you know, title cards and my old archive and all this other stuff that I've, I've collected over the decades. But going into your, your art, into your more of your mindset now. What was an early experience where you learned that art had power? You know, I can't pinpoint it, but I will say that when I was very young, my dad would take me to all the Disney movies and, you know, I was very much into cartoons growing up. And, you know, I don't remember my mom coming to too many of the, these animated shows, but my dad would take me to them. And I think he was just humoring me. <laughs> uh, but I, I think that just seeing the reaction of people around me, the, the laughter, because when you're watching it on TV, you know, you can laugh at it, but then to see that other people are also, you know, getting into it and, you know, expressing themselves as they watch it was a pretty powerful thing for me. And, you know, as I matured and as I grew, uh, and then, you know, once Pixar came on the scene, you know, Pixar has done a really good job overall, I think, with 
really pulling at someone's heartstrings. And when you stop and think about it, it's like, this is a 3D model that is animated. And yet the way it's animated is done in such a way that you don't think of it as a 3D model anymore. So one of the examples that I like to talk about in my class is the movie Monsters, Inc. And, you know, my daughter was of that age where she was like boo during the time when that movie, I think Monsters, Inc. came out in 2004, but, you know, we, you know, we would put that movie on for her as a little toddler. And it was just amazing how I could see my daughter as boo and, you know, like you see Sully as the dad and just like the, the, the way that the dad tries to protect his child. I mean, and so what I'm getting at is like, there are moments where you watch it as a dad and you're like, oh my gosh, it's like, that's like, you feel your heart tug and you, you, you go through these emotions all the while knowing that you're watching something that's being played at 29.97 frames per second. And it's a 3D model that was rigged. It was textured. It, it's like taking something that just looks like it, it shouldn't create any emotion. It's just basically the most emotionless set of cold tools that are used to create this, but yet it brings so much warmth and so much emotion and so much feeling. I think that's what really kind of made me realize that this, this medium has so much power. So yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> I mean, as you explain it, I'm thinking, damn, yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's like, but to have that, that technical knowledge and to transition it to, as you, as you've explained it, you're right. Like whether they used, um, I forget either poser or whatever other 3d modeling tools that they're, they're using these days. It's, it's yeah. Maya and a lot of custom yeah. stuff that they, that have, they've written in house, I'm sure, but. <laughs> It's just amazing. It's like, these are all clinical tools created on bits and bytes that are on ones and zeros. And yet they can bring out something that humanizes everybody that watches it because, you know, it's difficult to kind of hit everybody, uh, you know, and I think they've done a really good job of kind of understanding what it's like to be, you know, an individual that has their own problems and challenges and, you know, just offers a little bit of hope. So I, I, I love movies like that. I, I am not so jaded as, you know, to roll my eyes because something is leaving me with a positive note. I watch movies and I watch films, honestly, to escape, to feel better about myself. And, I, you know, I, I, you won't really see me watching any horror films or anything that's overly violent. And, you know, I used to watch that stuff when I was younger, but I've just become so sensitized to all of that that I just choose to, you know, in a world where we're, there's so much negativity and so much sarcasm and so much, uh, I don't know, just like general disregard for one another. I like movies and I like shows that are going to make me be a better version of myself and, you know, uplift me and in some ways move me to, um, to uh, be better in my own life. And, um, you know, I don't know if that's just a, a process of getting older. And I'm not saying I don't watch any action movies. I love action movies. I love watching those things, but I just limit the, um, the, like, I don't want to watch someone getting like stabbed to death multiple times or, you know, getting their head chopped off. And I realize that there's an audience for that, but it's just like, that to me is not where I want to keep my head throughout the day. I, I want to watch and I want to have some laughs and I want to see something cool. Wanting your life to be better in terms of what you're watching from a media perspective, but from a personal perspective, when did your life become better? I feel very lucky and I feel like it, it's been better since the day I married my wife. I mean, it's just like, she, she brings a lot to the table. She's kind of like the anchor. She's my soundboard. When my daughter came into the picture too, it's kind of like just having, I guess, family that, that truly cares about you. I think that's really where life has become better. I mean, and that sounds cheesy as all get out, but you know, that that's the fact of the matter. It's like, and I think it's just a state of mind too. It's like, I'm always hungry and I'm always looking for things. I'm looking for new opportunities and um, I'm willing to learn. And I think those are traits that I had, you know, growing up and I think those things have carried me through. So I'm happy. I mean, do I want more? Of course, because that's the human nature. We all want more, but you know, I have to say that I've been, you know, uh, in, in my own life, just being grateful 
is like one of the biggest traits that I think I've cultivated. And I didn't have gratitude, uh, you know, growing up, but as I've gotten older, you know, I've developed that sense of gratitude and I take pleasure in the smallest of things like, Hey, I can walk. Hey, I can breathe. Hey, I could use my right hand to draw. And, you know, it's only because I've seen enough life to know that there are people that whose lives were cut short or they were in an accident or they had something that happened where their entire life was changed forever. And we have to look at the fact that every day is just kind of a, you know, it's kind of an opportunity really. And we either have to use that opportunity or we squander it. So, you know, I don't know how many more days any of us has on earth, uh, but you know, I just want to make every day count and I want to wake up with purpose and I want to be able to um, say that I accomplished something. I'm, I'm very much like a goal oriented individual. And um, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of maybe a roundabout way of answering your question, but <laughs> it's the truth. What is the wisest thing that you have ever heard someone say to you? The wisest thing, I will have to quote Jack Kirby, where it's like done is better than perfect. I will make something and then I will create it and then I move on. And, you know, when you're working with clients, sometimes you just have to just do the best that you can for the time that you have because of deadlines and you just can't keep noodling with something and just trying to keep picking at it. So done is better than perfect is an attitude that, you know, I, I have learned to embrace. There's no such thing as perfect. So it's like, just embrace what you can do the best, give it your sincere effort and then let the chips fall where they may. And maybe later on, you may not like what you did, but that's okay because you're going to be in a different space if you're continuing to practice and learn. What's one mistake that you'll never do again? One mistake that I'll never do again. I, I guess that I will never underestimate what I'm capable of doing. I think sometimes we put bars around us and we put kind of like limitations around us. And I think I've been doing that, you know, consciously for a number of years, but I've become a little bit more enlightened, if you will. And I've become a little bit more confident. And I think developing that confidence takes some time. There's a lot of like, I don't know, like, uh, what's that term that they use where, uh, like imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I think I felt that for a number of years. Um, but I have grown to become more comfortable with what I have accomplished and what I'm continuing to accomplish and just making peace with the fact that maybe I'm not where I need to be and I'll probably never, be, never get to that point, but it's not going to hurt me to try. So, you know, realizing that I am more than just the title that's on my business card, realizing that I have so much more to give than just being put in a box and realizing that for myself too, you know, not being afraid of trying something new uh, and just putting myself out there and then not worrying about the result, but just focus on the doing, you know, just making things happen. If it's a mistake, it's a mistake. It's only a mistake if you uh, uh, learn something from it. So it's like, yeah, it's a mistake. I won't do that again and I'll, I'll move on. But um, I, I guess in a more, uh, on a more uh, <laughs> joking note, it's like, I, I probably would say that uh, never to over drink. <laughs> that, that is a problem. Uh, so, but you know, as I get older, it's like, you know, this is something like, you know, if you're in your early twenties and you, you make a couple of bad mistakes like that, then you, you quickly learn. What, sure. what sport would be the funniest if you added a mandatory amount of alcohol to? I think, uh, mountain biking. <laughs> you have to be totally on for mountain biking. So I can't imagine people that are under the influence, uh, going down and, and you know, going down those big hills and mountains without taking a tumble. Now, I don't know if it would be funny. I, I think it would hurt a lot. Uh, so maybe that's not the best answer, but I think martial arts maybe would be kind of funny as a, uh, uh, you know, alcohol with martial arts, maybe drunken master style fighting would yeah, be kind of cool. Say, yeah. just go, <laughs> go, go all Jackie Chan on. Yeah. And just, yeah. Uh, it's, I love that movie. Yeah. It's, it's a great movie. Amazing. All right. Uh, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you'd love to share with those that are watching and listening to this interview? 
I, I don't really know, you know, I'm pretty terrible about talking about myself, but I will say this, that I am always eager and willing to uh, help others. And, you know, with my YouTube channel, I really wanted to make it a resource for, you know, folks that are interested in leveling up. So I welcome any discourse or any comments, any feedback, you know, I am not, you know, going to get hurt if someone says something that is like, you know, construed as constructive feedback. Uh, you know, so please let me have it, you know, in a good and uh, constructive way. In, in terms of other things, you know, I'd like to continue kill, killartblocknow.com. So if you are an artist and you have unique ways of overcoming art block, or if you're just looking at resources to help you overcome art block, I would say check out that website. And I'm looking to uh, interview more folks on how they tackle art block. So I'll even put this out there for your listeners, Kurt, and yourself as well. If you know of any other artists that you think would be up for an interview, please have them reach out to me. And I would love to be able to share their work and share their process for overcoming art block. So that would be a, a great thing, I think. Doesn't matter where they're from, right? Like all over the world, doesn't matter? Doesn't matter at all. If they've had art block and if they've overcome it, I want to know about it. Everyone has one or two people that inspire them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Uh, who's inspired me the most? I have to say my wife. Uh, and I say that because she's had to change careers and reinvent herself multiple times over the 19 years that we've been married. And her tenaciousness and her can-do attitude has been super inspiring for me. She's... Uh, you know, she's sold cars, you know, and never having even sold a car before, not even knowing the different models and makes to being able to be a pro at it and outselling everybody um, uh, was remarkable to see. It's like, if we were to make a movie, it's like, I keep joking with her. It's like, you know, think about a uh, young lady from India that is going to the deep South in Savannah where these good old boys are selling Nissans and this, young lady who is completely coming in without any kind of preconceived notion. She's never even, she couldn't even tell you a Nissan from a Ford back then <laughs> and put her on a lot and, and have to sell cars. And she did a phenomenal job because she was so like a sponge mm -hmm. and people just felt way more comfortable with her and she just reinvented herself. And then, you know, now she's an ultrasound tech. I mean, my point is that she has never, um, looked at an obstacle and shied away from it. She's just, she's the kind of person that even if she's outnumbered, she will run right into her opponents. And that's something that I, I find to be absolutely admirable. So she's, she is uh, not only my rock, but she's also my inspiration too. From a professional standpoint, you have been in the industry for over 20 years. You have uh, created many works. You've made a beloved comic with PC Weenies and you continue to inspire another generation of, of amazing artists with your work as a professor in, in art. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I do. Um, because, and not to, not to have that hubris or whatever, but I think success is defined by many different aspects. And I think in terms of overall happiness, I am, I am happy. Uh, and I feel like I've accomplished, you know, going from like having no professional experience and not knowing how the dots would connect forward to a point where I feel like I have some, some wins under my belt and I've got some exciting prospects that are ahead. I feel happy. Am I content? No, because I still want more. I still want to be able to do more cool things, but you know, I have to stop and take stock of the fact that, you know, I've got my health. I've got a family that loves me. I've got work. I'm able to help others and, you know, impart what I've learned with my students and anyone else who watches my YouTube channel. So from that standpoint, I feel like um, I have some success. Uh, you know, can there be more? Absolutely. And will there be more? I hope. Absolutely. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Great question. So dealing with my failures, I have to distance myself. Like, you know, just because you fail doesn't mean you're a failure. And I think that's something that I had to learn over the years. It's like, 
in the past where I would kind of like associate a failure with me having some big, you know, flaw, but I think it's only a failure if we don't learn from it. So uh, trying to distance myself, but understand where that failure comes in, acknowledge and accept it, you know, you know, listen to what other people are saying, and then just try to make a plan to where you don't fail like that again. And, you know, we all make mistakes and, you know, I'll probably make even more mistakes as I get older too. But the important thing is to, you know, understand that you are not your own failure. A failure is just something that happens to you and you just have to get back up and you have to keep going after it. You know, it's like rejection letters. I mean, you get rejection letters, like say if you're applying for jobs, you know, you get rejection letters, but you can't just let that, you know, just because they're rejecting you, it, it, it's not just that, okay, maybe you're not a right fit, but maybe they're not a right fit for you. It's how you spin it, right? So it's like, you just have to keep at it no matter what. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as artists as, as you're teaching them, or maybe your younger generation of your children are looking to become creative in their own way, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Great question. Well, I can say that having a, the work ethic, um, you know, being in love with what they're doing. I think for me, if I look back at everyone who has inspired me and I go back to like, you know, my early days where I was a huge, and I'm still a huge Jimi Hendrix fan and Bruce Lee and all these other folks that I grew up, uh, listening to or watching, it was just, there was some kind of an X factor with these personalities that they just broke so many barriers and they just, you know, they didn't, they weren't caged in. They just kind of made their own thing. Um, and I hope that anyone who is going to inspire others has that same attitude where they're not afraid to go ahead and challenge the status quo. They're not afraid to try something new. Uh, you know, and, and kind of break out of the mold. Now, once you know the rules, you can break the rules, but, you know, break the rules and see what happens and be willing to make mistakes as you work. I think one of the things that is, that I'm finding to be somewhat of a concern is the fact that there's so much curation going on on social media where um, nobody wants to put up work that does not get, I don't know, 500 likes or whatever, you know? And, and I think there's a, there's a weird thing going on where the number of likes seems to equate with whether or not something is good. And I think that's just a really bad mindset. And for the younger generation to break that, I think they need to just make work without necessarily having to post it on social media, make work for yourself first, do it for yourself first, and then go ahead and, you know, post, you know, and don't be afraid to post what you've messed up on too. It's, it's fine. You know, post some sketches, post some other things. Um, I, I think we're just becoming more and more uh, kind of, uh, we're, we're too self curated to where the point where we see that um, the younger generation is looking at these folks and they're like, wow, they never made a single mistake. And their work, if I look at this person's Instagram page, for example, everything looks beautiful and flawless and amazing. And I can't do that. And what they don't see are all the failed attempts that, you know, people have had that they're just not talking about. So being open with your failures and being open with your, you know, attempts at something and, you know, and, and not owning the failures, but just using them as a springboard for a greater success, I think is a, is a really important trait for anyone who hopes to inspire somebody else, don't feel like um, you can't experiment and fall flat on your face. That's why you take classes. That's why you learn. Uh, if I'm teaching classes and if everyone already knows the material, then I would argue, what's the point in me teaching? You know, you're in a class because you're new to it and maybe you don't know it, but if you go in with a good attitude and, you're, and a willingness to learn, and, and you're willing to give it your all, then I think that you have what it takes. We all have to start from somewhere. Um, nobody comes out of the womb knowing how to hold a stylus or, you know, everyone like, what I like about Alex Ross, and I, I'm sure some of your listeners might be familiar with him, but Alex Ross is a phenomenal painter and he's done a lot of the stuff for Marvel and DC and, you know, but what, what I like about his Instagram page is he'll show 
images of when he was like four years old or seven years old of his own art. And guess what? His version of Spider-Man as a four-year-old was pretty much like everybody else's version of Spider-Man at four years old. The only difference is Alex Ross kept on pushing himself and kept on honing his craft to the point where he's like, you know, a very celebrated artist. And it's because he just continued to, to push and expect more of himself. And, you know, it's very easy to get dissuaded when you see, uh, you know, quote unquote, and I hate to use the word, but perfection, where, where someone looks at the work and they're like, wow, I can never do that. It's like, you know, maybe unplug a little bit, create work for yourself. Like I create a lot of work that I don't post on, on social media. And it's just because I'm doing it for myself. I'm not doing it for the likes. I want to just create something for the sake of creating things for myself just to be happy with it. And I think some of that put pushback is kind of needed. You don't have to put everything that you do on social media. Uh, if you want to curate, you know, just say, okay, well, maybe on Tuesdays through uh, uh, Thursdays, I'm not going to post anything on social media. I'm just going to create work for myself. And I think that when you do that, you're going to be more willing to take risks you're going to be more willing to, um, you know, you know, have some experimental stuff going on with your work, and you might make a new discovery that changes the way that you do your work entirely. But I think if you're just trying to feed the machine by posting stuff on social media, I think what ends up happening is you start to lose some of yourself because you're just trying to placate these quote-unquote people that you may or may not even know, and then it's kind of like a musician that just plays all the hits. Uh, because, uh, you know, she's asked to go ahead and play all the hits because that's what they expect of her. So she's not going to really change her, uh, format because she doesn't want to disappoint her audience. But sometimes you have to make a change and you have to reinvent yourself. And some people may not be there for the ride, but then you might discover something new that you never knew, uh, about you and you're, and you're breaking that cage. I've been asking those questions for the past 10 years now. So, yeah, th those are great questions, Kurt. I mean, really thought provoking. Really well, thought provoking. I, I do plan on creating a documentary with all of these answers that I've collected over the last decade. So that that is the goal. I can't wait to see it. I just have to actually spend time and put it together. <laughs> um, that being said, though, Krishna, as always, time flies with you. I love it. I love the fact that you're you're still passionate about what you're doing. I love you know, your energy that you bring to not only your art, but to the explanations and your YouTube channel is truly amazing. I do love it. And I, I love your, your interviews as well, too. That is something that I recently stumbled upon. So I thought this is, this is amazing. He's, he's found another niche that he's, he's just awesome at. So good job. Thank you so much, Kurt. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Hopefully we'll be able to speak to each other more than the once in 11 years or so. <laughs> well, uh, hey, you know, it's not like we're not talking on social media. So by all That's means, true. By all That's means true. if you have another upcoming project or whatever, please come on the show. I do appreciate it. Certainly. Thank you again for the opportunity. Anytime. Actually, what is your social media and all that stuff where we can find you? So on Twitter, it's PC Weenies, P-C-W-E-E-N-I-E-S. But then on Instagram, it's Krishna Draws and... Yeah, that's that. You know, my Instagram and my uh, my Twitter are the two main social media platforms. I'm not on Facebook, so uh, okay. yeah, reach out. Right. So, like I said, that ends this particular episode on Two Geeks Talking. Of course, look at Christian's work, look at everything that he's done and continues to do. Uh, amazing, talented person. You know, support him any way you can. Um, I'm not going to say the whole like subscribe thing as well. So there you go. <laughs> uh, but as I say every week, you can look at this interview, his past interview, and thousands of others I've done over the past 12 years on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com and our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help pull that out. Thanks for listening and watching and tune in next week on Two Geeks Talk. Hey all, Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.